a lot of people when they come to therapy, I think we're looking for what to do with those feelings. Usually it's wanting to get rid of the feelings. <laughs> and I think we can find ways of processing our feelings. We can find things to do to help improve mood, but we're never going to get rid of uncomfortable feelings because that's just part of being human. I mean, even as a person in the therapy world, like I can tell you, I definitely get anxious and I get scared and I get angry. So those emotions are never just going to go away. But yeah. hopefully if we can be in it, sometimes I actually find if you can let yourself sit in it, it will actually pass sooner because you're not fighting it. Welcome to Alignment Adventures. This is a podcast where we explore what it means to live a fulfilling, aligning, and present life. I'm your host, Lindsay Tanner, and I am so grateful that you are here. Hello, my loves, and welcome back to Alignment Adventures. I am so excited and grateful and honored that you are here with me today for another beautiful, expansive interview with one of my favorite humans, Dr. Katerina Ament. Now, Dr. Ament is a licensed psychologist. She is just such a warm soul that is so easy to talk to about all the things. And she's also my cousin's wife. So that is how I know her. I've known her for quite a long time now, but a couple decades, it seems like. And I just always savor the time that I get with her and the conversations that I have with her because I always walk away feeling inspired or lighter or just feeling so good. She's one of those people. That is exactly why I wanted to have her here on the podcast, not only because of her profession. She obviously is a licensed psychologist. She has her doctorate in psychology and therapy is something we mentioned so often in the pursuit of living an aligning life here on the podcast, but also her personality is just a perfect fit. And I wanted her take on all the things we talk about. And by the way, the things that she specializes in, I feel like are things that all of us relate to in one way or another, which is perfectionism, overthinking, highly sensitive people, narcissistic abuse, and proactive couples counseling. So that is what she specializes in. And I will share all of her information at the end if you're interested in working with her. And the beautiful thing is we now live in the digital age where you can just do therapy over Zoom. So it doesn't matter if you live in Denver, Colorado or not, which is where she lives. And fun fact, Katerina and her husband, Tony, my cousin, are the people that we stayed with on our RV trip. And they literally saved us. They were our angels when I had that like really bad sinus infection. I thought was migraines. I didn't know what was going on. We crashed at their apartment. They helped us take care of Arlo, truly saved our lives. So thank you so much for that. I will never forget it. So what do we talk about in this conversation? We talk about finding our own alignment. Of course, it's the key component of alignment adventures and finding what brings you joy. She talks about her path and how she chose to be a psychologist and how she got on that path herself. She also explains the difference between different options for therapy, which I found very interesting just because there are so many different options. She talks about the areas that she specializes in, which I already mentioned. We talk about connecting with our purpose, which is often connected to what we struggle with in our life. So interesting. And she also shares the most common thing holding people back, especially the people that she has worked with. We also discuss meaning our mental health in this day and age, which is so, so important. How to set effective boundaries and how they may look different for every single person. Establishing effective communication, especially with your partner. Dealing with big emotions, one of my favorite topics and misconceptions about therapy. So with all of that, let's get into this beautiful conversation. I know you guys are going to love Dr. Katerina Amen's energy as much as I do. Katerina, thank you so much for coming on Alignment Adventures. Guys, I have been wanting this to happen for so long. You are one of my favorite humans. You are so wise. You are so kind. You are so humble. You are all the things we talk about on here. Plus, you practice one of the things that we advocate the most on the podcast. So thank you so much for taking your time and energy to come on Alignment Adventures. I'm so excited. Of course. I'm excited. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> Well, we'll start with the first question, which this is such a kind of weird question to ask because 
Like, how do you answer it, right? You could go really deep. You could go really shallow. But who is a doctor, which I never say that, by the way, when I talk to you. <laughs> but I got to I gotta say, because that's who you are, Dr. Katerina Ament. Yeah, I don't even think I'm used to hearing that together, to be honest, because most of my clients call me Katerina or they'll just say like Dr. A. So hearing the full thing is a little bit weird and super <laughs> formal. Um, but so I'm a psychologist, which you kind of already, uh, mentioned, I guess I would say I value my relationships a lot. So, you know, wife, sister, friend, I think that's really important to my identity. And I know that's played a role too. And Tony and I talking about where we want to be. Tony's my husband, by the way, for listeners, <laughs> um, also a big music lover. So mm -hmm. we like hitting up concerts and stuff and, I would say I'm a bit of a nerd. I have a full on Harry Potter Lego collection, which is probably not typical for a 35 year old. <laughs> um, yeah, and I guess I should put traveler in there. My husband and I've done quite a bit of traveling, just got back from a long stint all over the place and finally settled back in the US. <sighs> Yeah, you guys did an epic, epic adventure around the world, which what's your Instagram that like showed all of that? I can't think it's of it off the top. Writing our adventure, writing with like a W. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go and check that out, guys, because they did such a good job of showing all these beautiful places. And I love the places that you guys went because they weren't like the typical places that everyone would think to go to when you're traveling around the world you really went to some places that I wouldn't have thought of that I'm like okay that's on my bucket list now and also guys I've been to their apartment I'm sure I mentioned this in the intro but this is the apartment these are the people that saved my life on the RV trip and I love all the Harry Potter Lego stuff I was actually just telling Stephen we should get a Lego set because I'm all about embracing your inner child and that's what you're doing <laughs> yeah it's so much fun it's like a puzzle that you get to put together and they're but, but they're way bigger than most puzzles you know like thousands of pieces so I like it <laughs> yeah and then you can put it on display it was just hard to make sure my child didn't come and like wreck it all but they were high enough most of them yeah. so we couldn't get it uh, well that is like such a good description of you I would add in so many things like ray of sunshine just like the perfect person oh, oh, oh. to come and talk to like you are, you are just such a warm spirit. And I don't even know how long I've known you now, but I feel like I've known you a really long time. And I think that's how I felt the first time I met you. That's just the type of person you are. And I, I think I know people will feel that through this conversation. So that leads me into question number two. Yeah. I'm interested to hear your, your take on this, but what does living in alignment mean to you? Okay, so I'm not gonna lie, I tried to think about this a little bit beforehand. For and sure. I think it's I think the thing is it's so individualistic. I don't think living in alignment means the same for every person because a big part of it is like I would say living according to your core values and mm -hmm. like what is most important to you. Are you making time for those things? Um, are you doing something that you find meaningful and purposeful in your life and I think sometimes when I ask that question like even with clients I think people's go-to is like work but I don't think the stuff we find meaningful or or our purpose has to come from our job or our career either I think it's just making it a point to build in the things that fill you up you know um so I think that's a big part of it but I feel like alignment is so many different things like it can relate to our day-to-day -day, it can relate to our relationships but I think it's also just like where you find joy you know so yes that's, yeah <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> I'm like taking notes over here I'm nodding my head furiously if you're watching on YouTube I relate to what you said about purpose and work so much like I had such an idea wrapped around that like I have to find my purpose and I have to make that like my full-time job and I have to make an income from it. And that is kind of like the trajectory I'm heading in, but I don't think that has to be the case. And that hasn't been the case the past five years of my life. It's just something that I like incorporate and I do because it brings me so much joy. So I love that you mentioned that. Do you find that to be the case with a lot of people like you work with or just talk to in your day-to-day -day that like 
do people struggle finding like what makes them happy? Because I feel like that is kind of the case sometimes. It's like people don't even know where to start with what makes them happy sometimes. Yeah, you know, actually it's having you ask that, I feel like it's like perfect timing in a way because, so I would say yes, yes, people do talk about that in therapy. I think people talk about that just with their friends or family in their day-to-day life. But the reason I say that's perfect timing is, Tony and I actually just went to like a holiday party for Halloween and we were chatting with people there. And I kid you not, I had a whole conversation with someone there about like how, when we're younger, we just kind of have to pick a path and we go on it. And I think we're not even always thinking about what we would really like or the long term. We just, you know, you go to school, you like have to pick something, you get a job. And sometimes it doesn't always like feel like it fits later but we're just doing these steps that we think we have to take because that's what the people around us are taking and so I don't know I would say that's a long way of saying 100% I think people talk about this um, because it came up at a Halloween event (laughs) I love that it's so true and those are the conversations I love having at a party, by the way. I'm like, let's get deep. Like what, what do you love in this life? Like what, what's going on with you? Um, It's also interesting too, because I just had a conversation yesterday with Steven's little brother and his girlfriend. They're in college right now. And one of them is switching their major, which is so common. I switch my major like five times, maybe not five times, a couple of times. And it is kind of insane that at this age, we ask, you know, what seem like kids, I guess they're adults by like the technical term, but you're so young, you're a baby and you're asked to like choose the trajectory of your life and you're investing so much money and time. And that's such a heavy decision. And I think, you know, for a lot of us, we kind of luck out and end up in a situation or in a path that does end up aligning with us, but that can be like a scary decision. And I feel like as adults, many people now in their late twenties or thirties or late thirties, they're in a spot where they're like, okay, maybe this isn't the path I want. And I feel like that can be a scary spot to be like, do do you work with people that are feeling that way? Yeah, I think it's come up definitely from time to time. I have used to work in college counseling centers too. So it would come up with my college students, you know, they're taking classes, they have to pick a major, but they don't know if that's what they really want to do. And I do think it's hard because we feel like we feel like we have to go to school right after high school and you feel like you have to get it done in four years and there's all these have tos Mm -hmm. and so then people end up just kind of making decisions or maybe even doing things by default and then I guess I would say that probably does get them out of alignment unfortunately Mm -hmm. but hopefully I I think the work that I've done with people sometimes is there's always time I mean I know Mm -hmm. I have a colleague actually that I used to work with and he was in HR and then he went back to school and started doing therapy. So, and I don't think he really got into that until he was maybe closer to 40. So you don't have to like, just have it figured out in your twenties, even though I think we feel like we have to. When you say that, like my body like exhales and relaxes because it's so true. We think we have to have it all figured out right now. And we have our entire life. I tell myself that a lot because I'm like, I want to do this. I want to do that. And it's like, Lindsay, you have hopefully (laughs) a long life to do all of this. And I think that's such a beautiful thing to normalize, like changing your mind or going back and getting another degree or, you know, getting a certification, something else or changing your path. I mean, me, myself, my goodness, I feel like I've had like five lives in my career already. (laughs) Like I've just done a lot of different things. So I'm also curious, this is one of the questions I wanted to bring up with you. How did you end up on this path? Like, did you always know you wanted to be a psychologist or is this something you just kind of like fell into maybe on purpose or by accident? What was that journey like for you? Yeah. You know, I think I always wanted to do something people related and when I was younger I think my ideas on that were maybe more medically based versus like mental health but I also think that's because when you're younger it's probably so much more common for little kids to say like I want to be a nurse or I want to be a doctor like there's all those go-tos right teacher police officer like the things that we see in our everyday lives 
Um, so I think it started off that route, but then as I started learning more about psychology, which probably started in high school and then learning more about it in college, I did make that switch. I would also say, aside from always wanting to work with people, when I was younger, I actually also used to babysit this little boy who had autism. And I think that was a really big moment for me. I got to actually like work with him on on one and I was kind of like working with him in a daycare setting like and I think mm -hmm. that was really rewarding and I guess I don't do that type of work now I'm not working with little kids but I still like that side of things like mm -hmm. working with mental health and I definitely like the one-on-one -on -one stuff you know just like sitting down talk, talking about people's goals like figuring out how to get there so so I think, yeah, always people, but it definitely morphed. Mm -hmm. Well, gosh, it is beyond needed right now. Uh, that is something I want to get into later. I'll talk about how we can maintain our mental health in this this time and space. But let, one thing I personally had a question for, and I think I know the answer, but I, I just want to hear your explanation because we do talk about therapy so often. I know there's different options. Like what's the difference between a psychologist and maybe another type of therapist? I know it has to probably to do with training and like yeah. clinical hours and your degree and all that stuff. But can you kind of break down like the difference between like the different avenues people can take when it comes to therapy? Sure. So there are a lot and I guess I'll just hit on some of them. Um, first, let me just like talk about what the difference between psychology and psychiatry is because I know sometimes my clients have questions about that psychologists do more of like this talk therapy kind of thing you know sitting down talking about what's on your mind psychiatrists actually have a medical degree so with them like those are the people that you might see if you're interested in taking medication they tend to meet with their clients less often and they tend to have shorter appointments too. Whereas if you're doing talk therapy, usually I start off with people once a week for like 50 to 55 minutes. So I would say that's the difference there. When it comes to therapy, oh my gosh, there's so many different titles out there. There's like licensed clinical practitioners. You can see a licensed social worker, there's licensed marriage and family therapists, you can see like drug addiction counselors, like wow. there's a lot of stuff and that's not even all of them. What I would say though is, so licensed marriage and family therapists, the name kind of says it all. They do tend to specialize with like couples therapy, marriage counseling, family stuff with licensed social workers or licensed clinical practitioners they are therapists they receive a master's degree usually so master's degrees or two-year degrees and then on top of that they have to do um, clinical training and get supervision as well and so it is kind of similar to the route that psychologists would take and that you do have to have a graduate degree and get yeah. a certain number of hours before you can be licensed but I would say the the at the doctoral level you're doing like four years of school plus like I did like three practicum experiences and an internship mm. and postdoc all before you get licensed and with master's people it's kind of a two-year track and then with like the supervision hours so okay. it's still similar it's just kind of I would say the length of time yeah yeah Okay. That's a good breakdown because yeah, I've always heard people like say their credentials and I'm like, okay, I know it's like all different, but kind of the same. So that was a really good explanation. Now with your practice specifically, which you just started your own practice, which is amazing. Round of applause. I'm so Thank excited you. for you and just inspired by your work. What is like, the typical kind of person you work with or like maybe what are some like common issues that you help people with? Sure. So I would say, to be honest, like in most sort of private practice settings, the the people that we see most of the, the time are honestly really normal people. Um, they're coming in because they're going through a stressful time in their life. Maybe it's a big transition period for them. Sometimes they might have some symptoms of anxiety or depression. Those tend to be the most common. Hmm. 
I also see clients who might have some trauma, maybe in their relationships or just like their childhood experiences, things like that. And grief might be another big one. Mm -hmm. I would say those are kind of like the top, the top ones that I would work with or have worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. I also have a very particular interest in working with people who've experienced narcissistic relationships. So I feel like that's a little more different. It's not typical for every um, practice setting, but mm -hmm. that's something that I'm pretty passionate about and have just mm -hmm. read about a lot. Um, it's something I relate to personally. And so I find meaning in working with people who've also experienced that. And I guess I should throw couples in. I'm just like throwing everything at you, but for sure. I love couples work. And I think I think that also kind of ties into some of the relationship stuff I was I was mentioning with whether it's like the narcissistic relationships, but I think it also plays a role in transitions, you know, a lot of times couples come in because they're going through a major transition in their lives or like, you know, maybe they all their kids are out of the house and they have to like relearn how to just be together or maybe you just got married and so I like those parts of people's lives. I love that you're mentioning couples therapy because I feel like, okay, for individual going to therapy, I feel like that's becoming more commonplace. There's not as much of a stigma around that, but I feel like couples therapy is still something that like people, like as a couple, people might feel, and they shouldn't, but they might feel shame around. But I've heard more and more people talking about it and just like, you know, the individual can go to see a psychologist for their mental health like the same for couples and you mentioned something in the beginning like you said you see a lot of quote-unquote normal people and I, I don't want to label people like that normal not normal I mean there's so many different reasons right. you could go to therapy but I just think that's an important point to make like you don't have to have something crazy happening to you to feel like you need to go and talk to someone it can truly be just like anxieties or you know and I know that's big or can be a small like a big or small thing but I just feel like that's such an important point to make is like you don't have to have something crazy happening in order to go and see a psychologist yeah. I feel like that is maybe something that I have had the thought around or like a preconceived notion for me and I, I just wonder if other people have that now the last thing I want to say is how you said you specialized in narcissistic relationships because, you know, personal experiences. All right, relating this back to purpose, this is something that some like people say all the time on here, like our purpose a lot of times connects to something that we have struggled with. So oh, here you are helping people with narcissistic relationships. Like that's something you're passionate about, you specialize in because that is something that you struggled with. So I just think that's such a beautiful way to like, go full circle in our lives like finding something that we struggled with and that's like what we're helping people with now yeah I I think that's true for I would say a lot of people in this field too like you know colleagues I've worked with or people that were in my program like the more you get to know them you start to hear their story I'm like yeah we're all here because we've been through something and it makes us want to do this work so I I think that's so true <laughs> that that's what kind of pulls people in so interesting now here's here's a kind of a broad question I have just because you you know worked with so many different people what do you feel like is the number one thing kind of holding a majority of people back from living in alignment or living their best lives or finding their own joy or harmony like do you feel like there's like a common theme or like something that you see more frequently that's like holding people back from stepping into alignment Ooh. I mean I don't know if this is super specific but I do think that usually there's some element of like fear or anxiety mm -hmm. and I guess if we were to tie that in with kind of like the sort of like the school and career stuff I think yep. so many people tell themselves a lot of like we tell we like kind of make a lot of limiting statements where people are like, well, I want to do this, but I don't have enough time or like, I want to do this, but I've already invested so much time in this. And 
it's like these rules that we came up with that I would mm-hmm. say are not hard and fast, but we think that they are. And yeah, so I, I think a big part of it is like, what ifs and, and fear. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if we can kind of challenge or like rewrite those rules, then we can start to take some of those steps that we want in a different direction. Love how you say that, like challenge your fears. So true. I mean, I still have them (laughs) all the time. (laughs) I I talk myself out of it. You know, most of the time I'm like, okay, keep going. But like, what tips do you have for working past those fears? Because we all, we all have them. And it is, it's just sad to see like people talking themselves out of going after things that just bring them joy. Like we said, you don't have to make a career out of it. You can, if you want to. But like even just like dipping your toe into things, what are some like maybe practical tips you have for just like working past those fears and anxieties? I personally think some some big ones that I recommend with clients are not, they're not even like these big groundbreaking things. I think big ones are like literally taking time to self-reflect and that can be surprising surprisingly hard but it doesn't have to be and I think the reason I say it's hard is in my experience both personally and just with people I know or people I work with we're leading such busy lives that Mm -hmm. I think it's so easy to almost be on like a hamster wheel in a way where like you get up you go to work you come home you make dinner like you get your kids to bed like maybe you watch an hour of tv and then you go to bed and you like do this over and over and you're not even taking time to just like kind of step back and like think about Mm -hmm. how you even are feeling in that moment that day or that week so I think part of it is just giving yourself some of that time and that can look different for different people maybe someone could try to take even just 15 minutes to like sit outside and sip their coffee in the morning or like maybe you like to journal before bed or something like that and when I'm talking about these things sitting and reflecting or journaling I don't think it has to be really time consuming I don't Mm -hmm. think you have to be doing this for a whole hour but I think you can just start building in like these little breaks and the point is almost to do nothing (laughs) like just just sit just breathe check in with yourself like ask yourself like how are you feeling that day how have you been feeling that week and like see what comes to mind because your mind will probably automatically go somewhere you know and then that will tell you how you're doing like that'll be a starting point so true I I think it's kind of hard for people to do nothing it's hard it's really hard for people to slow down and to stop and just allow, even for five minutes to stop and breathe. Like you said, that is so hard for people to just prioritize that. And I think even like the busiest people, <laughs> I hope my sister doesn't mind, but I always think of my sister. She's probably one of the busiest people I know. I feel like even the busiest people can find just a few minutes here and there just stop and breathe. And it doesn't have to be fancy. I think that's another thing that holds people back. They think they have to, you know, if it's meditation or journaling or whatever, they have to do it in this fancy way. No, it's just like stopping and checking in with yourself. So it just always puts me in awe, I guess, like how simple these practices always are, but we like overcomplicate them and then we don't do them. I think sometimes people think that they're supposed to almost like have this like checklist, you know, Mm. or we're supposed to like be given this like set of questions. And then when you answer these five questions, then you'll know if you're on track. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it quite works like that. And I I was going to say, I even have someone I've been working with right now where when you're so busy, like you said, with your sister, people also like, feel guilty if they even take a little time off yes like because they have so many things going on that they feel like if they aren't constantly working towards something then they're they get that guilt and they find it hard to justify it Mm -hmm. but I do think like when we're going 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 it's kind of like you run out of steam 
you know you're like a battery running on empty so it's almost better to take that time because hopefully it will help you recharge you know so the idea is take this time now so you don't kind of like spend it all at once totally I feel like this connects with something you probably also work with people on like the worthiness thing I feel like so many people stay busy because they feel like there's this like societal norm maybe or just this idea that we've picked up somewhere along the way that we have to earn rest we have to earn slowing down or we have to earn it I talk about this with Stephen all the time we we subconsciously put our worth in our work sometimes or like what we're producing our productivity so it's like if we're not productive like we're worthless <laughs> so I just find that an interesting connection to this whole conversation yeah do you feel like that's a common thing people I'm sure struggle with I, is the worthiness <laughs> I think I could almost go on like a soapbox about almost like where I think some of that comes from and I so yes you're to answer you yes I think that does come up and I think it comes up for a reason. I think it can come up due to like what we experienced growing up. It could Mm -hmm. be family expectations and not in a bad way. Like usually families just want what they want you to do well, you know, and they want to like see you succeed, but sometimes Mm -hmm. it can kind of like feel like unintentional pressure. And I think we can also get that from our jobs. Like when, maybe you thought it was going to be like a 40 hour a week job, but it turns into, you know, 50 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and even friends, you know, I mean, I remember during the pandemic, I would see posts on social media where people were like doing home improvement projects and Mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, well, I'm at home now. So I'm going to like accomplish all these things that I wanted to do when I wasn't at home. And then when you see your friend or your neighbor doing that, now you're like, "Uh uh-oh, I have to do that too. Yeah. So I think that pressure can kind of come in from like multiple avenues. And it's not that people can't be doing those things like they can, but we start to like be pressured maybe both externally and internally. It's not always intentional or conscious. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, that's such a good point. Like asking why you do the things you do. I feel like we hit on this earlier, but sometimes I hate the word should. Like, I feel like we should on ourselves all the time. Like I should be doing this or I should be improving my home or I should do blah, blah, blah. And it's like, why are you doing the thing you're doing? It's going back to reflection and just being self-aware. I feel like that is what you help people do, which is so important. It's just being aware of like, why you're doing the things you do and a lot of times it probably does boil down to like comparison or worthiness and all those things so this leads into like a bigger thing I want to ask you okay because this this all connects comes from societal norms from our parents from all of it how do we this is a broad question okay how do we maintain our mental health and stability in this like day and age when we are so connected we can access everything from the news to like what our neighbors are doing to like all that like what are some like tips we can do to just maintain our own well-being because I do think that's important we can get easily lost in the mass amounts of information happening so how do we how do we stay grounded within ourselves? So first, I'm definitely going to say that I think the way that we maintain that or what our balance is does vary from person to person. You know, I think what works for one person is not the same as what works for another. For sure. Um, so I'll kind of talk about like, I guess, some things that work for me, but also things I talk about with clients. But again, to listeners, it doesn't mean these are the only things. And that's why there's therapy to get the personal attention you need. Yes. I personally think like a big thing for me is relationships. I want to make sure that I'm not just spending my week like working and then just like being at home. I try to make it a point to call up some of my friends or do something fun on the weekend. And again, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. I mean, I even have had a friend over here just like for a girl's night like we literally eat frozen pizza and put on face masks I want to do that yeah (laughs) I'll be over soon (laughs) just kidding no I would love it (laughs) 
but I think that's so important for me, like, and I think for a lot of people for our mental health relationships are so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a big believer that that goes into how we handle stress, how we, you know, regulate our moods, like, you need those good supportive relationships. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's like almost a number one. But I also think hearing you talk about how we get all this information from like news and social media. I think a big thing with mental health too is boundaries. And that can be in a lot of different ways. That can be like, so when you talk about news, if that stresses you out, don't watch it all the time. I mean, I know it's good to be informed. Like that's great if you want to be aware of what's going on in the world. But you can probably keep up on that without watching the morning and evening news every single day. For sure. So I think you can set boundaries on that. You can set boundaries on social media. Like if you start to notice yourself doing that comparison game. And what I mean is like, you know, you're scrolling on Instagram and you're like, oh man, this person got to go here or this person just got a new house. If you start to notice yourself doing that, maybe pull back a little bit like you don't have to mm -hmm. be looking at all of those things and we can also set boundaries with other stuff you know when it comes to work I know back when I lived in Maryland I had someone I worked with that would sometimes call me at like 9 p.m I would just turn my phone off it's like you can call me you can leave a message and I'll respond the next day but it's nine o'clock right now and I'm not going to answer a word call you know? Good for you. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> so I think we can like set those boundaries with work, with the social news influences, and also with friends, you know, I think most people have kind of like different types of friendships, right? Like the friends you might go to for emotional support, the ones you go to when you just want to let loose and have a good time. And if there are some that you ever find draining, because that happens, you know, you might like adjust that too, or, mm -hmm. or maybe it's not even that maybe like you love all these people in your life, but if you're introverted, like me, you can't have stuff planned, you know, like multiple plans for the week. Like I usually need yes. some downtime to recharge <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. So you can like set those boundaries. You don't have to plan five things for like one week, you know, your friends mm -hmm. should understand and they'll still be there the next week yeah totally the first thing I thought of when you're you're listing off those things again it goes back to like awareness which I always say is one of the most important things but like being aware of what makes you feel good and what doesn't make you feel good so if like when it comes to the news which I feel like that is something I've been like struggling with that balance of feeling the need to be an informed like human being and citizen of the earth but also like not getting lost in the whatever you know but just being aware of when you reach when you you're doing it unconsciously and you're just so lost and whether it is the news or maybe a scroll fest for an hour and you're like oh my gosh this like doesn't make me feel good but I'm just doing it to numb out or whatever or distract myself it's just bringing that awareness back in to be like okay let me choose more things that like light me up and make me feel good like you mentioned at the beginning of this so such an important point now another thing I want to bring up boundaries which I feel like you could have some really useful tips for this especially when it comes to people in our life like what are some practical tips we can have for someone that maybe we love so much but know that some influences may not be for our highest good like how can we set some healthy boundaries with those types of people in our life yeah so first off I want to say I think that's really hard to do um especially if it's family I think we you know, we've been talking about like societal messages. And I think there's a lot of messages related to family. And I always hear people say things like, you know, that like, that's your mom, that's your dad, like families for life, you have like, or you have to dot, 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 or you should call them, right? There's those shoulds that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I want to challenge that stuff a little bit, because mm -hmm. I guess what I tell my clients, and maybe this will be kind of controversial for some people, but 
I think that when relationships feel good, you don't struggle with some of those thoughts or feelings as much, you know, like, if that relationship felt good, you wouldn't be asking yourself like, oh, well, how often do I have to talk to them? Or how often do I have to see them? What boundaries should I set? And those are good questions to ask in some relationships. But again, when it feels good, we're, we usually don't even have those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so when clients ask me that, I do like to throw that out there, that when it feels good, that wouldn't be coming up. And I think it's okay for people to set boundaries when they are having those thoughts. I will say though that setting a boundary isn't a black and white thing. It definitely, yeah. there's a spectrum there, right? Yeah. You know, and I guess on one end of the spectrum is like a relationship where you don't really ever seem to limit like those phone calls or visits and things like that, or you feel comfortable sharing openly and honestly with that person. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you could have people that may have decided, hey, this isn't a good relationship for me. And I can't even, you know, have this person in my life right now. Yeah. But there's a big in between, you mm -hmm. know, there's people who may say like, oh, you know, I still want this person in my life. I'll talk to them once a week. I'll see them on family holidays but I don't want to live next door to them. Like <laughs> for sure. So I think it's a big spectrum and I don't think anyone, like, I don't think me as a, as a psychologist or even a friend or family member can tell you what those boundaries look like. Yeah. I don't think anyone can set that for you, but I think it's good to realize it is a spectrum and it is mm -hmm. okay for it to be whatever it needs to be for you. Yeah. I love that explanation because you're right. It's not sometimes people think it needs to be this or that, and it can be anywhere in between that you need it to be that that serves you. I heard someone say one time, like have them at the closest distance where there's still love or something like as far, you know, so hold them at the distance that you feel like it can still be like a loving relationship, whether you said that's once a week or maybe not talking to them as much or whatever it may be. Now, it also made me think of something that I also want to get your opinion on, and then we can wrap this up. But you said you work with couples. Yeah. And what are some tips for couples? Like, I feel like this is something I become more aware of recently, just from like having these conversations and doing this work, but just like getting your point across in a effective, conscious way is not innate to most of us. It's like so easy to get triggered and be like, well, you did this, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. What are some tips for when you are triggered by your partner or frustrated or mad at them to be able to tell them in a way that helps the situation and helps both of you grow? That's hard. <laughs> so I'm going to give something that isn't necessarily about how to get your point across, mm -hmm. but I feel like this is something that helps before you get to that point. No, this is good. Um, so I actually talk to couples about adult timeouts. <laughs> no, but but there's a reason for it. So yeah, we all experience the whole range of human emotion, right? And your partner, no matter how much you love them or how much time you spend with them, you're not the same person. So you are not going to see eye to eye on everything all of the time. And sometimes when you don't see eye to eye, that does trigger different emotions, whether you feel sad or disappointed or angry or worried about not being on the same page, whatever that is, sometimes that emotion can be so strong that we don't always communicate effectively or we communicate in a way that will kind of trigger like a defensive response from the other person. And so the reason I say adult timeout is if you can like feel your heart pounding or you notice that you're starting to like uh your voice is starting to raise a little bit maybe you're not to the point of yelling but you know you start talking a little bit louder or if you notice your palms are getting sweaty whatever that is when you notice those things see if you can take a break you know go to another room in the house you can do what feels right for you. If you want to think about those feelings, go for it. If you just want to do something as a distraction for a little bit, do that, take a shower, mm -hmm. whatever you want. 
but I would say it's better to take that break and then try to talk about whatever that issue is than doing it when you feel flooded. So that's, that's what I tell people is like, I guess if you were to think of your emotions on a scale from like zero mm -hmm. to 10, if you're approaching seven or so, you know, like you're definitely over the halfway mark, you're mm -hmm. probably getting flooded and you're probably not going to communicate as well as you would if you brought that down a little bit. And when we take that break, I think the goal isn't necessarily to get to zero. You know, you probably still have those feelings, but can you at least take it down like two notches? So I think that's a big thing is like when you notice yourself in that state, like pull back a little bit, don't avoid the issue, but pull back and then come back to it when you've had a chance to just, you know, just like chill for a little bit, whatever that looks like for you. So good. And I love how just everything connects. Like we were talking about earlier, like giving yourself time to reflect, give yourself time to like cool down and process. I did this yesterday. Arlo was just being a toddler and we were doing all these things at once. And I could, I could feel myself getting flooded with anger, resentment, frustration. And I was like, okay, I'm going to let myself feel this, you know, which is hard sometimes. Okay. But here's another point I want to make. I feel like and hopefully this is changing. Talk about like schooling and societal norms. Dealing with your emotions is not something that is prioritized as at least in our country <laughs> at this time and space. And I do think it's changing. I think the pandemic changed that a little bit in the schools. You know, they're doing more social emotional work and stuff like that, which is so good. But it's like, even as adults, we struggle with these big emotions, like emotions are tough and they're always around. We're always emoting in some way. It's just so interesting. That's why I love having these conversations. And that's what you do is help people handle these big emotions. Do you have any things that come to your mind when you're just flooded with anger or resentment or sadness or whatever? Yeah. As far as like things I do, I can definitely say probably my go-to if I'm feeling really anxious or angry in the evening, I definitely uh, will journal. I mm. literally have like a notes pad like on my phone and I'll just like get out my thoughts. Um, yeah, especially if, you know, if you're experiencing that stuff at the end of the day, usually it can be hard to even go to sleep. So yes. I think it's, if you're not going to be able to sleep and you're just going to be in your head, you might as well just get it out. You yeah. know, you might as well write it down. So I think that's a go-to for me. Yep. Social support is going to tie into this too. I mean, if you're feeling those emotions, reaching out to someone that you can talk to about that. Okay. I think you, therapist, <laughs> psychologist. Yeah, <laughs> you can, I mean, you can see a therapist, you can see a friend, a family member. Yeah. I think all of that is really big. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just, sometimes distraction works too. When I talk with that about people though, the point isn't to avoid your feelings yeah. or avoid working through an issue, but mm -hmm. it is just to, it's to give yourself a break because sometimes we can view something differently once we've just had a chance, like once we pause a bit. You know, yeah. we just need to get away from it. And then we might be able to see it from different angles. Totally. I love that you're journaling in your phone because I do that too. Because oh, yeah, I have so many like notepads. <laughs> it's so much easier. Okay. If you're having like a mental block about journaling, everyone has a phone. I mean, pretty much everyone listening right now has a phone. Use your phone. You can do it whenever. It's so good to just like, don't judge yourself. Just like get it out, brain dump. And I like seeing where I end up I like start somewhere and then where I end up I'm like oh that's how I feel about that or like that's the root cause of that okay like it's so powerful I love that you mentioned that I keep saying I'm going to be done and and that's round okay. out with our like ending questions but I keep thinking of other things okay last question before we get into our last group of questions but like feeling your feels in a healthy way this is another hard thing like just because we avoid them or they come out in an unhealthy way, we project them or neglect them. What are some healthy ways we can feel our feels? Journaling, I feel like is a good one. Yeah, talking to people. 
feel like I'm going to sound kind of like repetitive, but I no. really think so much of it is just giving your space to even ask yourself how you're feeling. And yes. sometimes with clients too, a lot of times I hear people say things like, oh, fine, or like, okay, or neutral. And I'm like, those are not feelings. Fine's not a feeling. If you're not used to thinking about emotions in that way, then like literally get yourself like a list of different feelings and try to see if there's one that you relate to. Like, are you feeling more frustrated? Are you lonely right now? Are you sad? Are you... Whatever it is, I think it's better to try to identify that and not just tell yourself you're like good, you're fine. Because mm -hmm. I think that's really common. So I'm literally just self-reflecting and identifying what that is even if you're not sure what to do with it, I think identifying it is kind of the first step. And probably the other step after that is just like being in it. Like, so mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they come to therapy, I think we're looking for what to do with those feelings. Usually it's wanting to get rid of the feelings. <laughs> and I think we can find ways of processing our feelings we can find things to do to help improve mood but we're never going to get rid of uncomfortable feelings because that's just part of being human I mean even as a person in the therapy world like I can tell you I definitely get anxious and I get scared and I get angry so those those emotions are never just going to go away but yeah. hopefully if we can be in it Sometimes I actually find if you can let yourself sit in it, it will actually pass sooner because you're not fighting it. And I think that's kind of a difficult concept sometimes. Like we want so badly to just erase it, but yeah. it's almost like we end up working against ourselves because then you start worrying about how you're feeling. So it ends up adding another layer of emotions <laughs> onto it so true we think we can just avoid it and that's like probably how people end up in these really sad situations are people that are like so down like a hole of emotions because they've just never allowed themselves to feel it and it's like the paradox is if you just allow yourself to feel it that's how you not necessarily get rid of it because it will come back because we're humans <laughs> but that's how you process it and that's how you get to the other side is allowing yourself to feel it so such a beautiful reminder. Okay, let's get into my last group of questions, even though I thought of another one, but I think we can wrap it into this one. I have time, so whatever <laughs> works for you. It's just, I could talk to you all day. I mean, this is how how it is when we're around. We just talk, 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 except last time I saw you, I was dying, but that, we're making up for last time here. Okay, how can people, if they are feeling the call, and the beautiful thing now is like, we have Zoom, we have the internet, so we can do this online now. How can people, if they're feeling the call to find you, work with you, and along with that, maybe to tail into this question that you're answering, what are some, I feel like we just addressed a misconception about therapy, like people think they're going to get rid of their feelings, but are there any other like misconceptions that might hold someone back from taking that step, even if they're feeling the nudge? I think one big thing that holds people back is like the fear of being judged. Um, and I would love to say that that never happens, although I know sometimes it does. And I guess what I would say is if you find the right fit with the therapist, mm -hmm. you shouldn't feel that way. Like I, I yeah. do think when you're meeting with someone that's a good fit for you, you feel like you can talk about whatever is on your mind and and a good fit for you may be different than what's a good fit for your friend. Like sometimes when I'm talking with a new client about what type of therapy might be good for them, I really think it's not just about the type of approach that the therapist uses, but it can also be about the personality of the therapist as well as the personality like of you, you know, mm -hmm. and if those things mesh. So yeah. I think there's this fear of judgment, but I think one thing hopefully is that most of the people I know in the field, we got into this because we really do care and we really do want to help. And yeah. um, 
most people I think are pretty open to talking about whatever your experiences are. So I usually tell people if you're new to it, give it a try. And there's no harm in even meeting with like two or three different therapists for a consult and then picking the one that feels right for you. So yeah. if you go to someone and you meet with them for a few sessions and it's really not your jam, that's okay. You don't yeah. have to stay. You mm -hmm. could try someone else. So I think I think the judgment factor is probably the biggest holdup. But I would say just like try it out. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of trial and error a little bit with it sometimes. For sure. Follow that nudge if you're feeling it. And you are like the least judgmental person I know. I feel like I could tell you oh. I'm an alien or something, which who knows, you know, and you'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so. Oh, when did you arrive here? <laughs> what do you think of this place? <laughs> it's crazy, man. It's crazy. So I feel like I, I'm obviously very biased because I know you and I love you and all that. But if you're feeling the nudge, Katerina, Dr. Katerina Amen is such a beautiful person to work with. So how can people, if they're feeling the nudge, work with you? Honestly, like Google search is pretty easy. If you Google yeah. Katerina Amen, you'll probably find me. My practice is called Tailored Therapy and Counseling. So mm -hmm. if you want to check out my website, it's tailoredtherapyandcounseling.com. Perfect. Perfect. Love it so much. Okay. These last two questions are really fun are mostly fun, but I love asking people this. It just kind of helps us understand the person on it on a deeper level, on a different level. But what is your favorite alignment activity in this time and space? So an alignment activity is something that you just love doing because it, you feel like time and space have disappeared. You just do it for the pure joy. Honestly, um, bubble bath. <laughs> yes because okay so here's the thing like when I like take a bath it's it's much more of like a sensory activity like you're not just like you know quickly washing your hair or whatever but you know I like light a candle and like you have the scent of like bubbles or bath salts and things like that and so I think just like the feeling of being in the water and then having like those sensory things is just really soothing and I, I'm not going to lie, it's not something I do like every day. I mean, but if I have a quiet evening, you know, maybe it's the end of the week. I just love getting like getting to do that. And you just kind of do nothing. You know, you just sit in there, you like soak in the warmth and it gives you time to reflect, you know, and, and I think you can even play like soft music in the background, too. And it's just nice, you know, you're not distracted by work, you're not distracted mm -hmm. by like household stuff. And we're also not just kind of like, you know, engaging in like those like quick dopamine rushes by <laughs> scrolling and things like that. So that's probably my go to right now is I love a I love a good bubble bath. <laughs> Again, it goes back to the simple things and it is, it's such like, talk about creating a space for yourself where you can go within and connect and like reflect and just be, just be not to do anything else. That is such a good idea. And I love creating like an ambiance, like having candles and nice music and it's the little things that just really take it to the next level and experience. And I took a bath. I I really haven't been a bath person. I hate to say it, but I blame the horror movies I watched as a child. <laughs> the scary things always happen in a bath, but I'm whatever, work past that. I took a bath when we went somewhere for our anniversary and there was like a jet bubble bath. It was amazing. I was like, why am I not doing this more? This is so nice. Plus, and I'll just throw this out there, but the more senses that you can engage in one activity at a time like the more relaxing it actually is like actually on your nervous system so I just thought I'd throw that out there like there's actual evidence that when we can like activate like our sense of sight and like touch and sound and smell even taste when you can you know use multiple of those at the same time it tends to like be really soothing on your body. And there's different ways of doing that. You don't have to do a bubble bath, but we can find different ways of, of doing those things. 
That's so interesting. Well, it makes me think when you do go into like a spa environment, you have that experience. Mm -hmm. And if you go in the bubble bath, like get yourself a good drink then too, maybe like a hot chocolate or wine or whatever, (laughs) you know, whatever fits for the moment. But that that's another way to engage that sense. That's such a good point. So interesting. People do it when they run too. Running is very physical, but you can like have your headphones on and run in a pretty area where you're looking at the trees changing right now in the fall, you know, so then you have the physical sensation, you've got like a soothing environment to look at and you can listen to music. That is my favorite thing to do right now. I am obsessed with the trees. I'm sure in Colorado, it's even more gorgeous, but I'm like, this is amazing. (laughs) So pretty. Uh, okay my last question I know I I just can see him right now from my window I'm like don't fall stay but I know that's how the seasons work okay my last question for you is and this can be tricky but if you, you could give one piece of advice to anyone on this path on this journey of just trying to reconnect with themselves find their happiness find their alignment maybe they're thinking about therapy what would that one piece of advice be Oh gosh, that sounds like two things when it's like one piece of advice and then maybe they're thinking about therapy. I know, I'm sorry. I said too many things. Just whatever comes to your mind. (laughs) I think, okay, this might just be a kick that I'm on like Mm -hmm. with talking about people right now. But I think lately I've really liked asking people like what is one thing that you used to really enjoy that you find yourself not really doing anymore and not taking time for? I think that's a big thing you know it's like the older we get we feel like we're not allowed to like have fun time (laughs) Mm. so so good I feel like you and Tony are a really good embodiment of that you you have not let your inner child it it makes me think of inner child it doesn't have to be something you did when you're a child but typically that's what I think of like you guys still prioritize those things that bring you so much joy And that's such good inspiration, whether it, you know, whether it's Legos or bubble baths or whatever it may be going to a concert, like making time for the things that bring you so much joy. Yeah, I think we try to, it's a balancing act. (laughs) You guys inspire me all the time. Yeah. Like I said, you're just some of my favorite people. I'm so glad you finally came on the podcast. I feel like this may not be the last time. We'll see how you feel. There were like (laughs) 10 other topics. I was like, oh, I should bring this up. And I'm like, okay. It's been an hour. <laughs> Respect okay. your time. But thank you so much for coming on. This is just, it's so aligning for me to talk to you and talk about these things. And I'm sure everyone else can feel it. So Katerina, mm-hmm. Dr. Katerina, amen. Thank you so much for coming on Alignment Adventures. Yeah, thanks for having me. Katerina, thank you so much for coming on Alignment Adventures. I say this a lot, but I truly feel like it's not your last time. I just love talking to you and I could talk to you for hours. So if you're interested in connecting with Dr. Katerina Aitment and checking out her services, you can go to her website, which I will link in the show notes, tailoredtherapyandcounseling.com. Or like she said, you can Google her name. Please share any takeaways you have with either of us. You can screenshot it and tag me on Instagram at Lindsay with an A M Tanner. If you are new here, please hit subscribe because we have new episodes every single week. They're either interviews like today's beautiful, expansive interview or solo episodes with myself where I share my heart and what's going on in my alignment journey, which I always set the intention that it helps you along your journey as well. Also, if you have not yet and it feels aligning, please leave a review for the podcast. It's such a beautiful way to support what I'm doing in my work and helping more people live their most aligned lives. And it's a free way to do that as well, which I love. So sending you all so much love, all the highest vibes. And of course, I will see you in the next episode of Alignment Adventures.